Our gospel lesson is always read the second Sunday of Easter. It's what you heard already and got to see the special effects. I'm just going to read it now from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing in him you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you. Jesus, it's a good thing I'm not Jesus. That's all I can say. Peace be with you. Peace, Peter, you rat. You were the one who denied even knowing me three times. Not just once. Three times, Peter. Three times. Peace to the rest of you who ran like roaches when they turned the lights on. As soon as you thought you were in danger, peace, Jesus says. Peace be with you. That's what he says, all right. Peace, that Jewish understanding of peace is not just the absence of warfare, or in this case, the absence of anger. Peace is wholeness, fullness of life, prosperity. It's all the good that there can be. Peace, Jesus says to them, not where were you when I needed you, or what have you done, or how could you do this to me. He shows up and he says to them, peace. Because I will ever forget this line. I can say it in King James from memory. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the expiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's the old language. Now it's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus shows up and brings peace. The disciples who in John's account, which we read, and it's a little confusing this morning. If you were here last week, we read Mark's account of the resurrection morning. The women go away and they keep quiet, even though the angel says, go tell them, or the young man dressed in white, not even identified as an angel at that point. When the stone is rolled away and they see the empty tomb, he says, go and tell his disciples that he will meet them where he said he would. And they were too afraid to say anything. But this, I'm so glad we had Debbie's explanation, because Debbie did the John's story of Easter where Mary Magdalene is outside the tomb crying, and he appears to her, and she calls him rabbi, teacher. And he tells her to go and tell them, and she runs and tells the disciples. But here they are, the same day, the same Easter day. They have gone from an empty tomb to a locked room. But nothing stops Jesus. Jesus as I said last week, and as I say every Easter, they didn't move that stone, whether it was the angels or God. The angels moved them on God's account. The angel moved the stone away, not to let Jesus out, but to let us see the tomb was empty so that we could see for ourselves that he was no longer there. And then there's Thomas. I hate calling this Doubting Thomas Sunday because is he really different than most of us? How many of you would say... I want to see this myself. i got to see this to believe it. How many of you have ever said, i got to see that myself to believe it about anything? We're all folks who need proof and validation, and that's what keeps a lot of people from faith because they don't see Christ in the world today. People have said to me, I don't see him back, and he said he was coming back, so where has he been for the last 2,000 years? That's when I say he has been with us because he's in us. 
because he breathed his Holy Spirit not on the disciples. That's a mistranslation. He breathed life into the disciples. This is John writing, remember? John who begins with his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Just as in the beginning, God breathed life into the clay of the earth, and it took on the form of humankind created in God's image. Now Jesus Christ is breathing the Holy Spirit into them. A little Pentecost. But it doesn't quite take, does it? Because the next week they're there and Thomas is with them. Now I think that's another case of peace be with you. Because I think the Holy Spirit did a little bit with them. Because what did Thomas say to them when they said, we've seen the Lord? He said, you liars. Were you drinking? What are you thinking? I'm not going to believe until I see it for myself. But he's still with them. They've let him back in the room. I think I would have tossed him out too. But we don't know where he was, but he was out into the world. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't locked away in fear. Thomas, the one who had said when Jesus said, we need to go forth from here to Jerusalem, and they said, Herod's going to kill you if you go there. Thomas says, then let us go with him to die. That's, that's who Thomas really is. But we tend to fault him for his doubt. But his doubt led to his belief because he desperately wanted to know that Jesus was alive. And he is the only one who proclaims not just my Lord and my God, my God. This is my God who is here. God raised from the flesh in Jesus Christ, raised from the dead into newness of life. Let me read to you the beginning of what Barb read from 1 John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have seen, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. That's the kind of sentence John writes, rather long sentence. But isn't it true we have to declare what we've seen? We have to know that we have seen Jesus Christ in the world. And what keeps people from the church, what keeps people from faith, is too often not seeing Christ even in the church. Recently, I spoke at the funeral of one of my dearest friends of all time. He was one of the kindest, most generous, gentlest souls I've ever known who ever walked the earth. He's someone whose faith had been tried through the years, not because of God, but because of the hypocrisy he saw within the church. But yet his mother always, always talked to him about the goodness of God, and he saw that in her. And by the time of his death, he had come to a place where he said he wanted to see his mother again. He wanted to be with God, and he believed that God was love above all else. Good Sunday for that if you want to read John's gospel, John's epistle, excuse me, the first epistle, where we're going to talk a lot about the love of God being revealed to us. But if people aren't seeing Jesus in the world, we need to ask ourselves why that is. Because Jesus is alive and living in us and through us. It reminded me of what happened in 2004 when I was serving in West Virginia. The little town of Keatesville in Maryland, which is right across the Potomac River from Shepherdstown, West Virginia, were given a notice that the Ku Klux Klan was going to rally in their town. They were going to have a parade. They were going to march. There's nothing they could do to stop it because they have a constitutional right to gather and assemble and have their protest. But what they did was they got together. The churches especially took the lead and they got together. And remember, at that point in 2004, the Imperial Grand Wizard of the KKK in the state of Maryland, first name was Reverend. He was the pastor of a congregation and wanted to march wearing a hood through the town. So what they did was they got together and they worked with the community's heart and soul, the people there, and they decided they weren't going to fight them. They were going to offer them what was really the heart of who they were as a community. The slogan they came up with was love, not hate. They had a symbol. They got a dove to represent the Holy Spirit, and people put it in the windows of their homes. So when the Klan walked by, they saw love, not hate with the picture of what we know as the Holy Spirit on their windows and on their doors so that people would know who they were. And they gathered in other parts of the town. They had pizza parties and dance contests. Athletes came and spoke. And that morning at the Dunkard Church, the historic church in Sharpsburg, Maryland, there was a worship service that I was blessed to attend where we prayed for peace among God's people. So what does that have to do with Thomas? 
tell you what it has to do with Thomas. There was a man who came to the meeting who had lost his faith in God because he'd lost his faith in the church. He found his faith again. He found and proclaimed Jesus Christ because he saw people being Christ and showing Christ in the world. He saw Jesus Christ in their gathering. So when I mention things like racism, I don't want you rolling your eyes. I'm not calling anybody a racist, but that's how you fight it. And that's what we're called to do as Jesus Christ people. We're called to stand up, stand up and say with all that we are and all that we have in us that Christ love, that Christ is peace, that Christ is shalom and wholeness for all people. This is who God is. And even though we sin and fall short as the church, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. And in him we see who God is and we see the depth and feel the depth of God's love for us. I think in this story we can also take a cue from Jesus himself. Now, they gave Thomas a hard time through the years because Thomas says, unless I see for myself, I'm not going to believe. But when Jesus comes out of his tomb, to Mary, she sees who he is, and he says, you can't touch me yet, I haven't ascended. But he goes, and he says peace to them, and he shows them what Thomas wants to see. They don't have to ask. He shows them his wounds, because even in his resurrected body, he bears scars. Now, we go to great trouble to hide our scars. We will have cosmetic surgery. We will wear makeup. We'll do anything to hide our scars. But why don't we take a cue from Jesus and show people our scars? I've said this to you before, and I'll say it again. The best churches I've ever been in have been called AA groups because people go there wounded and broken and find love and redemption and healing and peace. They find forgiveness, and they're encouraged to forgive others in God's name, and they're encouraged to go to the people they've wronged and make restitution and make confession and make peace. Lots in this little story that we read every year. Don't just go out of here saying, oh, Thomas, poor Thomas, 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 Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. He's talking about us there. We're blessed, and certainly we are blessed. Now, instead of calling this Doubting Thomas Sunday or Expiation for Our Sins Sunday, we could call this Epistemology Sunday, because that's what this is about. Epistemology is one of those $4 seminary words that means the study of how you know what you know. You ever thought about that? How do you know what you know? You know? How do you know what it is that you know? It's really a, the discussion in philosophical and theological terms of the difference between belief and opinion. We have to go into the world not saying, it is my opinion that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. It is my belief that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I know with absolute certainty that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead because I have a relationship with him now. You can know a lot about people. You can know a lot about celebrities, but you can know the Lord God in Jesus Christ. You can know him personally. You can have a relationship him, with him like you can have with no one else. I often envied one of the kids in one of the confirmation classes I've had through the years because I said to him, how do you know what you know? And he said, my mom told it to me. It's got to be true. <laughs> I liked that answer. He said, if my mother said it, it has to be true. I want you to go out of here this week saying, how do I know what I know? How do I know that Christ is raised? And how do I show it? How do I show my scars? Because by showing your scars, you're touching his. Don't be afraid to say to someone, you know, I felt the same way you did. If someone says to you, I have doubts or the church is full of hypocrites, I'll say, it is, and we have room for one more. Come on in and join us. Because all of us fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We all fall short of being who we proclaim to be in Jesus Christ. But that's where we have an advocate, someone who goes to God on our behalf and says, let me give them my peace. Let me show them my scars. Let me invite them into a new life. Because we want joy for them. We want joy that is complete. I hope it is your joy to share your faith with someone, especially someone maybe who's struggling, maybe someone who has lost hope or lost faith. We're still living in difficult times. We're not together quite yet. I still, Until I can reach out and put bread in your hand and say the body of Christ given for you, we're still living in a world that's not quite familiar to us. And this is temporary. But God's love for us in Jesus Christ is eternal. 
So go home saying to yourself today, what is my, what is my hermeneutic? There's another seminary word. How is it that I know what I know? How is it that I have come to profess what I profess? What is my epistemology? Forget all those words. Just say, I know that Christ is my Savior because I have a relationship with him, because I feel his love surrounding me through the love of other people, through his disciples, through the forgiveness of my sins, through the grace that I have been shown, and then share that joy with someone who needs to hear it because the world needs to hear it. They need to hear it from you. They need to hear it from me. They need to hear it from Epworth Church and every church on the planet. For the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.